Omega-3 and its brain transport may turn out to be an incredibly important target intervention for dementia and the preservation of brain capillary health. People with high levels of omega-3 DHA are almost 50% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease compared to people with low levels. But why? Brain transport of DHA via the MFSD2A transporter is crucial for maintaining the blood-brain barrier. Furthermore, where we lose parasites, which prevent brain barrier leaks, just so happens to overlap with the loss of these transporters of omega-3. I cannot agree more. I think there is a more and more studies um, coming up nowadays Omega-3. And you mentioned MFSD2A, which is uh, one of the markers we are studying carefully because it's, it's specific to the smallest blood vessels in the brain, so the capillaries, and that's where the per most of the parasites are. And there is a recent studies uh, um, that shows that uh, as we age and with dementia, MFSD2A, so the receptor for omega-3, it's reduced at the, at, at the blood vessels. And there is also a link that where there is a reduction of MFSD2A on blood vessels, that's where we see parasite loss. So we can almost connect what we, we were saying earlier. Of course, these are just a few studies and it has to be uh, confirmed. But apparently there is uh, more inflammation of the blood vessels to go back to the first question to link it, which uh, as we age also MFSD2A transports and other transporters, not only this one, but this one in particular, is decreased at the capillary at the capillary bed, which have an impact apparently on parasite function because we can see that these hot spot of MFSD, MFSD2A loss are also hot spots of parasite loss which means that where we have the leakiness of the barrier. So yes, I cannot agree more. I think we have to study a bit more DHA omega-3 and how this impact blood-brain value functions because that could be a, um, some uh, preventive interventions, uh, things like that, even like targetable drugs, like uh, with drugs. But um, yeah, I cannot agree more. I'll just mention, I, it's, I remember reading um, a couple of studies years ago where uh, animal studies where omega-3 deficiency caused a reduction in, in GLUT1 transporters in the brain. Uh, again, of course, omega-3 deficiency also breaks down blood-brain barrier, you know, yeah. so it's kind of um, what's first, you know, like is, is, is Always, glucose, yeah. reduced glucose getting into the brain, affecting blood-brain barrier, is blood-brain barrier affecting the glucose transporters or both, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's it seems tricky to sort of figure out, but, um, that's the chicken and egg question all the time. Um, same thing with, you know, with the, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on omega three, but it's basically the same thing when it comes to pericide loss on the table activation, like pro inflammation, breakdown of the barrier, loss of blood flow. What is happening first? It's always difficult to address those questions because in human, most of the clinical studies are cross-sectional. You look at one time point. Now, um, I think there's more and more studies that follow individuals longitudinally with scanning, with uh, looking at biomarkers, looking at neuropsych testings. So we're going to get more answers very, very soon. So there's big centers working to that. But for the omega-3, yeah, um, I'm not surprised that you said that Omega-3 deficiency leads to uh, a reduction of GLUT1. That's what you said? Yeah, yes, it has been correct. Shown. I haven't read that paper, but um, but it goes well with what we said earlier, right? There is a vicious circle um, where um, I think it's likely that, of course, the endothelial parasite crosstalk should be very, very involved in that uh, problems, in my opinion. And that's something I would love to, to study. I, um, I'll send you my paper. I wrote a, a, a sort of interactive review article back in, gosh, it must have been like 2018 or something, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have references because I, for, for a lot of the studies, like the, the deficiency in omega-3 causing GLUT1 transporters to go down and Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, go it ahead. just rings a bell. Um, I, I just remember, um, reading a couple of stories and it's uh, very relevant to what we do in the lab is that, yeah, omega-3, the fact that you give omega-3 to an, to aged animals, and I told you what, as you age, you have pro-inflammation, like 
like a, an hyper activation of the brain endothelium. Uh, and a couple of studies I have given some omega-3 to the mice, and I remember seeing a reduction of one particular protein that I really like to study, and we are currently studying, is VKM1, vascular cell adhesion molecule 1. And that and uh, and omega-3 was able to reduce these levels. And we know in the lab, we know that VKM1 plays a major role uh, upstream of pericyte uh, uh, detachment. So again, it, it's um, there's a lot of things that can be connected. Uh, I think it's very interesting. And just another word on VKM1 is Tony Wiscore in uh, Stanford University, uh, one of the big lab working on proteomics and all these uh, fancy homics uh, techniques. He looked at Alzheimer's and um, and uh, healthy controls. Uh, he looked at their plasma and he has looked at using proteomics, looking at different proteins, which which uh, Alzheimer's, sorry, and normal aging. And what he found, I think the most striking finding was normal aging. He found, um, I think, 30 plus uh, proteins in the plasma that were elevated with normal aging that were related to blood brain barrier. And if you look down, I think f uh, the top five candidates were uh, cell um, proteins that are part of the endothelial uh, uh, cells, obviously. But the number one that stood out as the number one protein that is elevated with normal aging was soluble VKM1. So everything, um, uh, you know, <laughs> if you put some studies together, it kind of makes sense. Uh, there is a bit more to dig, but uh, I think it, it makes sense and it might go well with also what uh, omega-3 is, omega is doing to the, to the vasculature. So that'd be nice to dig further. It's very interesting that you mention uh, Tony Weiss Corey as well, because uh, if I recall correctly, uh, he's also been involved in research where he's transplanted um, young plasma into, into, you know, older mice and Correct. it's sort of rejuvenated in the brain. And it's like, well, are there proteins? I think the opposite was done as well, where it's old plasma was transplanted into younger mice and it sort of accelerated. Yes. And I think if I recall correctly, blood brain barrier breakdown was part of that. Um, and yes. so it's like identifying those proteins that it's no, causing I think it. He's, he's doing a fantastic work and, uh, and yes, correct. Uh, he's doing. He's he's looking at the, the the proteins that we have in the young blood that will help not only uh, brain functions or anything like uh, to help not aging too fast, but also we found a few key proteins that are involved in uh, maintaining blood brain barrier as we age. So I think it's very interesting. And he's using also the para parabiosis model where he can uh, link um, age and young mice. But I think right. it's it, very important studies. Uh, I think you mentioned this very early in 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 our discussion about you know blood brain barrier when it becomes quote unquote leaky. You know this allows molecules that usually don't pass into the brain to then pass. And uh, you had a paper where you had published a, a couple of years ago with, I think it was with your postdoctoral mentor, uh, Dr. Slovovic, about <laughs> a protein called fibrinogen, which interestingly enough is also like when I go and get my inflammatory biomarkers measured, I like to look at fibrinogen as well of, as well yeah. as high sensitivity, sensitivity C-reactive protein. It's an inflammatory marker. I mean, it's yeah. involved in blood coagulation, but um, you found this in the brain. What is the significance of that? Yes. Um, yes, and it's not only two years ago. I think there's, um, I think the first report, it's probably 10 years ago, but uh, the first report was on, again, brain tissue samples, very valuable tissue samples from the donors, uh, where we see that uh, in if you compare a controlled brain, uh, someone cognitively normal, no, no issues whatsoever, and another cyber's brain or a small vessel disease brain, you start seeing what we call this um, extravascular deposition. Uh, fibrinogen is one of them. It's one protein that is supposedly in the blood. It shouldn't be in the brain at all. But we start seeing this extravascular uh, deposition of fibrinogen, which means that to cross, it has you have to have some degree of breakdown of the of the barrier. Um, 
So it has been found in Alzheimer's disease. We also found that in animals that either do have Alzheimer's disease or have some sort of brain power issues. And we know that this protein um, that is um, important for blood co coagulation, as you said, and inflammation, has nothing to do in the brain and it's toxic. It's just toxic. And we found that it's neurotoxic, so toxic to neurons. It's also toxic to oligodendrocytes, uh, where we found that um, the, uh, the oligodendrocytes are basically cells that are making up myelin and make sure that the white matter is intact and we can function properly. And those, those oligos are crucial in the brain. And we show that when you have a leaky barrier and you have fibrinogen going in, the oligos are very sensitive to that, uh, to that fibrinogen. So they take it up, so they internalize fibrinogen, and they die by what we call autophagy. So it's almost like a suicide kind of test. And which leads to white matter disease. And if we go back, white matter disease is a common feature of Alzheimer's, small vessel disease. And as I said earlier, also it's a, the source of white matter disease is likely a brain barrier breakdown. So fibrinogen might play a role in this formation of white matter uh, disease. So yes, it's a very important protein that we found. We, um, interestingly, we, in animals, we were able to reduce uh, fibrinogen levels systemically in the blood. Of course, at a level that you don't want to increase um, to have some coagulation problems or increase bleedings and things like that. So you have to reduce at a level that you don't start doing uh, bleeding or clotting. But just by doing the just by reducing the, the fibrinogen, fibrinogen level in a mouse model that do have brain bar issues, we were able to to demonstrate that there is less obviously makes sense. less fibrinogen going in to the brain, less white matter da damage, and also interestingly by reducing fibrinogen, we were able to to partially uh, restore. Uh, vascular functions in terms of blood flow and also uh, integrity of the barrier. So fibrinogen has probably different roles, not only uh, coagulation and inflammation, probably a bit more. But that's, I think that's, um, that's one other way. We can target toxin things in the blood um, to avoid doing damage to the brain. I think it's probably easier to fix, easier, I don't know, but fix the blood vessels rather than doing that. But at least it's another evidence that, okay, a leaky barrier is leading to to uh, uh, damage to the brain, and 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 you don't want that, obviously. And the last thing on fibrinogen is, just remember now, fibrinogen can activate uh, the brain resident immune cells that are microglia cells uh, through CD11B, so that's a specific receptor. So when fibrinogen gets in, it can bind to microglia, so it will induce an over reaction, over inflammation of the brain, which will be detrimental for uh, for many things, uh, for the functions of the cells around it. And that reminds me that there is a fantastic researcher, uh, Katerina Kasudlu. She is at Glad Gladstone University, UCSF area, where she, I think she developed an antibody that blocks the interaction between fibrinogen and microglia to avoid that over, uh, like overexpression of inflammation or overactivation of microglial cells because she's also a strong believer that vascular dysfunction are very early and a major contributor to dementia. So that's a yeah. very interesting uh, research. It's, it's very interesting. And again, like you said, it, it really um, shows the importance of maintaining the blood-brain barrier so that it doesn't allow you know, things like fibrinogen, which is involved in blood coagulation, to cross into the brain. And and again, as you mentioned, the inflammation, it's activating microglia cells and it's causing then, I mean, that whole process you described earlier, the inflammaging and parasite detachment perhaps and all that. Um, it also, it, as I was reading and doing some background research on some of your work, um, and because I knew of the inflammatory role of fibrinogen, you know, I'd already been familiar with that protein, you know, separate of uh, what happens when it gets into the brain. I, um, I was looking up omega-3 because I had remem remembered coming across some studies with it. And interestingly, uh, people, so air particulate matter. So when you have um, like air pollution, particulate matter, when people are exposed to high amounts of it, it causes their fibrinogen to go up, right? It's again, an inflammatory okay. marker as well. 
but people that were taking in high amounts of omega-3, it blunted the increase in fibrinogen in plasma. And so um, it would be very interesting to see if in some of the animal models you were discussing, if omega-3 could blunt, you know, the white matter dysfunction caused by fibrin fibrinogen getting into the, into the brain. So again, it's another prevention, more, you know, easier, low-hanging fruit thing that people can do now, right? I mean, yes, making exactly. sure they're taking in enough omega-3. Yes, exactly. Um, no, I, I cannot agree more. Um, we don't want, don't need to repeat what we said, but yeah, there is this uh, kind of vicious cycle where omega-3 may play a major role into uh, vascular functions, of course. It's not even may play, I think that it does play a role. Um, and it might play even a more important role in people at risk for Alzheimer's. It's possible like the APOE4 carriers that we've talked about. 